All right, to quote Obi-Wan Kenobi, we are going to take our first step into a much larger world in Chapter 7. So we're going to start working exclusively with continuous distributions from here on to the end of the course, right? We're never going to work with discrete distributions again for the most part. Um, discrete being what we covered in Chapter 6, namely, you know, you can have the value of 0 or 1 or 2, but you can't have 0.236 of something, right? All right, and we learned uh, formulas that would help us find the probability, for example, like the binomial distribution formula. Fine. But for continuous distributions, we needed different formulas. Um, namely, we need something called the probability density function. It's an equation that you use to compute probabilities of continuous random variables. Now, what are some properties it has? Well, the area under the whole thing has to equal 1. That's because of what we learned in Chapter 5, namely that areas, probabilities, have to sum to 1. Um, and then the other thing is that the height of the graph has got to be greater than zero for any possible value of the random variable, which isn't that big of a deal. Now I'm going to start by showing this off with the uniform distribution. Now the uniform distribution we learned way back in chapter two. Let me just bring it up real quick. I know what page it's on. I just got to find it. There it is. Ta-da! All right, so the uniform distribution we learned way back in chapter two was just touched on briefly. It's a distribution where the frequencies basically are the same, more or less, for every possible value. So a classic example of this would be like a die. Like if I had a 20-sided die, yes, there are such things, then every single side should show up about the same amount if you, if you toss it. Now, will it be exactly the same amount? No dice don't really work like that, but it should be roughly the same amount, right? And the longer you roll it, the more it becomes like that, right? Law of large numbers from chapter five, okay? So basically everything is evenly spread out, right? You don't have any peak in the middle. You don't have, you know, peaks on the edges. It's just kind of all roughly the same. That's the uniform distribution. And it works for discrete stuff like die rolls, but it can also work for continuous stuff more or less. So Suppose you have a cable repair person could show up at any minute in a two hour period, say from three to five. And honestly, when I say any minute, I mean, I could mean any second, any nanosecond, any whatever, right? But I just put minutes. So we're going to say from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. So first thing we got to do is draw a graph of the uniform density function. Now, since it's uniform, it's a rectangle. Basically, everything is equally likely. Every moment is equally likely. Now, what's the height of the thing? That's the thing you really got to figure out. Now, you can kind of ignore the little gray box in the middle that we don't need to talk about right this second, but it'll it'll be coming just one. <laughs> That's part B. But part A is just this exterior black rectangle. Okay. All right. So how do you figure out how tall this is? Well, remember the area of the whole big rectangle is one. All right, but then you know the base is 120 minutes total. Why did I pick minutes? Well, because they said minute up here. If they had said seconds, I would multiply 120 times 60 and get how many seconds there are, or whatever. Um, if they had said a one hour period, I would be saying 60 minutes, right? If they said one and a half hour period, I'd be saying 90 minutes, etc. okay? All right, now the area of the whole thing, because it's a rectangle, is base times height. But I know that the area has got to make one because it's probability. Probabilities have to sum to one. That's what it says right up here for number one. So I know it's one equals 120, because there's 120 minutes total between three o'clock and five o'clock, and times the height, the height of the rectangle. All right, then I just divide both sides by 120, and I get that the height is one over 120, and that's what I put right over here on the left-hand side of the graph. So the height of the rectangle is one over 120. I have now drawn this picture. Now down here, they want to know what is the probability of the cable repair person showing up between the 10th and 25th minute. So this is what I shaded in here. There's 310, there's 325. That would be the 10th minute, right? 310, and then the 25th minute. And I shade in between them because showing up between the two of them would be any time in between the two. Well, how many minutes is that? So I take 325, take away 310, that's 15 minutes, right? There's 15 minutes wide down here on that x-axis. Okay, so now what's the area of the little gray rectangle? It's, it's a rectangle, so it's still base times height. I know it's 15 minutes wide at the base, and I know the height is 1 over 120 because I found it up above. So that's 15 over 120, which makes 0.125. So that's your probability. 
Now, what is the probability the cable repair person shows up exactly, exactly at halfway point? All right, well, the halfway point is at 4 o'clock, but it's at 4 o'clock exactly. I'm not saying 4 o'clock to 401. That would be 1. Matter of fact, I'll type that in. Let me see. Hold on. I'll be right back. There we go. If we had said 4 o'clock to 401, then the probability would be 1 times 1 over 120, because there's only a minute there, right? But I didn't say that. I said exactly. That means 4 o'clock point, oh, 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 forever. But of course, that's an, that's a moment. That's an instant. It, it's even less than a moment, right? It's It's infinitesimally small. There is no width to that. I mean, if I was going to draw it, it'd be a line, but that line has no width, right? And that means it has no area. Lines don't have area. Area is a two-dimensional thing. Lines are only one-dimensional. So the answer is that it's not possible. You can't show up exactly at that instant, right? You can show up in a time frame, right? Like 4 o'clock to 4 o'clock point oh oh five or something like that. Like it takes you time to arrive, right? People don't just poof into there. there. So it has no chance. And that's going to be true for us in general, for continuous distributions. They're going to have zero chance of exact. Now that's very different from chapter six. Right here, this is chapter six. So this was page 15 of those notes. So right here, we were able to find the probability that, see it, exactly five people in the sample are afraid of being alone at night with the binomial distribution. It wasn't even hard, right? We just made binome dist found it, no problem. But that's because it's a discrete distribution. Discrete distributions, you have nothing but exact values, right? So let's just think, this was the successful free throws we had. You exactly get one, zero, or exactly get one, or exactly get two, right? That's the whole thing about discrete. But continuous doesn't work that way. Continuous, you have to have, there we go. Exact would be equal to something infinitesimally small. So it doesn't work, right? So you have zero probability when it's a continuous distribution. Now, one other thing to note before we leave this page, and I just kind of implied it, but let me just mention <laughs> that just like with a discrete distribution, the area under the graph of the density function over an interval represents the probability of observing the random variable in that interval. In other words, this area of this gray box that we found here, that's the probability, right? So if you find the area of the box, you find that probability, which is very similar to what we were doing in chapter six, when you found those areas of those bars, right? Or excuse me, the height of the bars, you were really finding the area and it all worked out continuous distributions, it's a little bit harder to see, but it still works. All right, so let's look at the normal curve. Now, James Bernoulli, um, who is the inventor of the binomial distribution, and Abraham de Moivre started studying the binomial distribution at length. And what they noticed, both of them, was that, here, let me zoom out just so a little bit so you can see both of them at the same time. So this is when n is equal to 15 but your probability is equal to 0.5. And this is when n is equal to 70, but the probability is 0.2. Now remember, we learned that at the end of chapter 6. Here we go, chapter 6, the very end. So this one's kind of the first graph, that if if p is equal to 0.5, then you're kind of normal-ish, right? See that kind of bell-shaped curve to it? But if it wasn't, if it was 0.2, and you just pick a large enough n, look at this. This is what the graph looks like for n equals 15. It's very skewed, right? right? But then if you get a large enough n, then it sort of makes that same shape again, right? the normal curve. So de Moivre, poor guy, very smart, but not able to really make a good living because he was French living in England, and they were kind of snobbish towards him. Um, and James Bernoulli, one of the famous Bernoulli family, they both noticed this thing. Um, and they called it all sorts of things. But um, Carl Pearson, who was around in the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, and very involved in the eugenics movement, which we can talk about um, <laughs> at a later time, uh, coined the phrase normal, because he just didn't want it to be named after any particular person. Who knows why? Um, he kind of had an ego, so I'm surprised he didn't name it the Pearson curve, even though he didn't figure it out, but whatever. <laughs> All right, so um, 
it had a continuous random variable is normally distributed and it, or it has a normal distribution. If it's relative frequency, histogram has that, that shape of that normal curve. Okay, so if, if it's normally distributed, it makes that kind of shape. All right, so what does the normal distribution look like? Now, well, we've already learned this kind of stuff, that 68% is within one standard deviation, 95% is within two, et cetera, et cetera. We learned that way back in chapter three. So let's think about a couple of things. It is symmetric about the mean. There we go. Sorry, I tried to be cutesy, but unfortunately the program I used to make those little white boxes is actually the program I'm using to record my voice right now, so I couldn't get cutesy about it. So anyway, um, it's symmetric about the mean, right? See, the middle's got a peak to it, and that's where the mean, the median, the mode, they're all the same place at x equals the mean. It has inflection points. Inflection points... Um, if you take calculus, it's where the second derivative is equal to zero. But if you haven't taken calculus, don't fret. It's just where the graph is its steepest. So right here, like if you were skiing down the sun, like on a slope, that would be where you're going your fastest. And then over here, right there on that side. There's, they're the same place on both sides because sigma is the same value. So if, I don't know, for example, if, if mean was 100 and sigma was 10, this would be 110 and this would be 90. And this horizontal axis here is a number line. It's the same number line you worked all through your math life with. It just has different tick marks than what we're used to. You know, we're used to seeing 0, 1, 2, 3, but we're actually centering this number line at a completely different place every time. We're going to center it at mu. Although, to be honest, we will do 0, 1, 2, 3 for the standard curve. The standard normal curve is what it's called. All right, the area under the whole curve is 1, just like we said, because it's probability. Probability has to make 1. That means the area on each half, the area to the right of mu is 0.5. The area to the left of mu is 0.5, or 1 half. Um, as x increases without bound, the graph approaches but never reaches the horizontal axis. Right, so hypothetically speaking, these go on forever and ever and ever and ever, and the graph just kind of surfs along the x-axis. It's called being an asymptote, if you ever learned that in algebra class. That's what it is. It's an asymptote, a horizontal asymptote. Alrighty, and then the empirical rule. Now notice the word approximately in there approximately 68, approximately 95, and so on. That's because it's not exact. In this chapter and in later chapters and from here on out, we're going to be much more precise than that. We're going to start making Excel or StatCrunch do these numbers and calculations for us. Hmm. All right. In case you're interested, in case you ever want to graph it for your own benefit, this is the graph of, or the equation for that graph. So where sigma is the standard deviation, mu is the mean, and e is Euler's number, 2.718, and so on. And pi is, of course, pi. So that is the equation for this curve, right? So it literally is a big curve that you're graphing. Like, a, you know, in algebra class, you graph lines and parabolas. This is a more advanced curve. Alrighty, we're done with that. When I see you here next time, We'll work on objective two, the graphs of normal curves and what they mean for us. See you then.